Hey there, Golden Bears. How are we today? It's good to see you. Well, allegedly, virtually, and just hope and trust you're doing fine. Hey, we're going to start on 6.7, Becoming an Urban Nation. And um, there's a great quote here. What shall we do with our great cities? What will our great cities do with us? The question does not concern the city alone, but the whole country is affected by the condition of its great cities. In this time period, we need to recognize that post-Civil War, America goes on not only an expansion east to west, but we also have our goods that are trying to find its ways to the golden shores of Europe and down to Latin America and beyond. In order to do that, we have um, factories that need employees, and those employees are going to be coming from the immigrant nations. And so there's a lot of interesting things at play as to what creates problems in Europe, namely our cheap uh, farm products that we sell to them, uh, causing millions of people in Europe to lose their ability to grow crops. They then descend into America. What does this create? By the time we get to 1900, uh, New York is the second largest city behind London in terms of population size. Chicago is a close four. You have every area that is rural, people moving from those areas into the cities, not only just in the landscape of America, but also in Europe as well. We're seeing the transformation by the 1900s, uh, early 1900s, of, of an industrialization that is gonna begin rivaling that the world has yet to see. Um, this is a just a, a thing that I'll be doing with Steger Select in terms of looking at charts, etc. But we need to recognize that this population growth is what's going to begin triggering kind of some of the problems that we see in the landscape of this thing called the Gilded Age. Remember, gilded meaning something covered with gold, a gold patina. But when you scratch away the surface, you reveal the rust uh, beneath. I like to start with a story here that kind of conveys to the deeper meaning. Um, many of you know, or hopefully know by now, that our family lived in Mexico for 12 years, and every Monday, um, our, our group of students that were with us um, would travel to this orphanage in outside of Ensenada that helped children with AIDS or major disabilities. And often, uh, parents didn't know how to handle, didn't know what to do, and there was no government support, at least when we first started going there, to do this, and so loving people from the states went down and opened up an entire orphanage that eventually became three different homes on the end of a cul-de-sac, if you would call it. And these kids that were the most severe, severe, or having AIDS, uh, would live um, with care and love and attention. Well, on one such Monday, Ted and Rini, the directors of it, says, hey, Doug, come with us. We wanna take you to kinda go on a discovery with us. And so it was there that uh, we went and visited this uh, neighborhood about 30 some minutes south of, of Ensenada. It's a neighborhood of a lot of migrant families that had moved up from um, deep, deep south of Mexico in looking for work. They're a particular indigenous people group, so that's kind of beyond the point. And it is there that Rini had heard of a child living in a cage. I'm like, are, are you kidding me? A child in a cage? Yeah, that's what I heard. So we kind of round, roamed around the neighborhood. Uh, I don't know why they brought me. Maybe they thought that I could be the thug that's going to withstand uh, the, the, the neighborhood scrutiny. But I began asking the neighbors, hey, is there a family here that has a, a child living in a cage? People weren't even bashful about this. They're like, yeah, you know, right over there, Wedito, Wedito, over there. And so they kept pointing us to where it was. And sure enough, as we came up to this kind of really, really decrepit place, uh, there was a child outside on the porch, uh, he was about seven years old, in a cage. And from what we can tell at that point, uh, the parents put him in that cage when they go off to work. And then uh, they come, you know, when they come back from work, they release him out of the cage. But the kid had developmental issues and physical issues that he would often hurt himself. And because they were there without any other family support, they felt that was the only way that they can provide a means for their home and their family, etc. Now remember, these are really, really impoverished people. And at least they were trying to take care of the kid as best as they could. And so it was there that we uh, came back. Um, I didn't do this, but they came back and met with this family later on. And uh, they says, how about you have your son, his name is Teddy, come and live with us. You can come visit him anytime you like. And we have better care, better facilities, for this boy uh, to meet the needs of him. And you know what? Teddy went on to live 
uh, for close to 16 years in that home. He's still at this point, I haven't checked back on it, still probably does live with them. Um, but what is neat that the parents would faithfully come and visit him every holiday, every weekend, and, and just be part of his journey. I share this with you is that, although a really ugly and stark reality of, of, of what is taking place um, down at that point, and I think things are different now in Mexico and the government supports are there, but this kind of speaks to what it was like in America at the turn of the century. Uh, children were left on their own devices, government agencies were not there to protect and provide, families had to do whatever they could, so both husband and wife and aunt and uncle and everything, it was just a challenging time and so there was going to be essentially a need for reform uh, here and we'll get to that as we kind of pl you know plot along into this um, lesson. We need to recognize as I said uh, the population has quadrupled in things. Um, we see that there's very little government oversight as to how these cities and towns and, and metropolises are growing. It's like yeah let's just meet the basic need that we can and this is what is going to create what you know you call slums and and this dumbball type of construction that I'll talk a little bit later later um, but it allowed um, new engineering things to be created to develop where we can't we don't have enough space on Manhattan to go out wide because it's an island but we can certainly start going up and and so as contractors started going up and using shoddier and shoddier materials to save money there was no regulations or no zoning laws to inhibit th this type of things all the public utilities um, were privately held, many of them standard um, and Rockefeller owning quite a few of these things. And so there was a very tough time for the, the cities to develop municipalities to kind of, you know, create guidelines. I mean, we live in a neighborhood here in, 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 uh, where we have HOAs uh, that tell us uh, we have to have our Christmas lights down, for instance, by t a week after uh, New Year's or else they can come around and find us and stuff like that. And on one hand, I'm like, what? I'm going to kick you to the curb. On the other hand, it's like, that's cool. So the neighbors aren't having Christmas lights up in July, of sort of thing. And so, you know, since then, obviously, we've made a lot of changes to that. But at this early time, the, the industrial cities could not handle all the changes that were taking place in this time. You need to recognize that in the 1890s, when the Census Bureau was taken, um, Frederick Jackson's turn of the frontier thesis we basically said America has a release valve that we can take as many and many and many and many as immigrants as we want because they can keep flooding the West and, and helping populate that area. Why? The West wants them. The only way they'd be go from a territory to a state is you need more people moving there. And so, you know, Utah's and Arizona's and New Mexico's like, please come, 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 we'll take you. Problem is there wasn't anything for there, for there to do because they were deserts and there wasn't enough water and so it could only handle so many people. And so Frederick Jackson basically in his frontier thesis is saying, well, if we don't have a way to expand, this is perhaps going to endanger democracy. In what way? Well, overcrowding is going to create problems and, and, and factories and we're not going to pay our workers. And so this is going to create a tension point uh, between the workers and the owners of the factories. And, you know, sure enough, his predictions had proven true. We've, we've talked before on prior lectures about how the railroad has extended and, and created new industrial sectors and this mechanization that is taking place in the factories where it's no longer one person doing six tasks but now one person doing one task for 10 hour days. Um, th this mechanization said we need more and more people to do this and so this became a drive to get people off of the farms and into the cities looking for more work or new opportunity. Imagine being 16 years old and uh, you're either uh, walking or sitting behind the horse, uh, you know, a, a horse's bottom while you're tilling the field or you can say, oh, I can go to the city. At least at night I can go out with friends and do sorts of things. Another thing we need to recognize is that technology made the city seem to be more attractive. We have lights going in, we have parks going in, we have um, sewage systems that were being improved, we have Elevators, um, Otis was the, Otis, you can still go into uh, many places today, O-T-I-S, and still see that name. That was one of the first inventors of the elevator um, that allowed uh, buildings to go taller than 10 stories high um, in this time period. Um, we recognize uh, Mr. Holmstead, I'm forgetting his name off the top of my mind, but Olmsted developed huge city parks in Pittsburgh, in um, Philadelphia, in New York, he was part of creating part of the whole downtown area of Manhattan, San Francisco Golden Gate Park. So this Olmstead um, was a famous 
person designing open space so that way people have breathable areas for us to go uh, and, and experience fresh air rather than living in, remember, if they're living in 10 story, 20 story, 30 story buildings, this is the way in which they wanted to reduce the spread of disease and the spread of breathing bad viruses and everything else. And that was probably very, very important to this time period. We also need to recognize that as, as uh, the West continued to kind of grow, the urban centers were growing at even a finer and a, a stronger pace. And so please recognize the role that this, the railroad had and the electric trolley system had in, in allowing people to bring goods and services in and out but it also was able to change how and where people live with specific reference to the trolleys. This enabled people who were wealthy, middle class or wealthy to say, hmm, I don't think I need to leave in the city anymore. What if I was to take the trolley out to an area that's 20 miles out and live there and then come in? And this was often where we begin seeing these new suburban areas beginning to emerge um, and migration patterns of the immigrant poor people staying in the main part of town and the wealthier or middle class moving out. Well, the second thing that we need to talk about is that this migration began taking place to the cities from the African American population. We've talked at length about the Jim Crow laws, we've talked about the segregation, we've talked about how Plessy versus Ferguson, um, you know, created the separate but equal. Uh, we talked about how uh, the disenfranchisement by voting and everything had, had made it very, very difficult and challenging uh, for the African-American uh, and in some instances the poor white living in, in the South. So what is the result of this? Many African-Americans move into the Clevelands, move into um, uh, the Pittsburghs, they move into parts of New York, okay, where we'll talk about later in another time period with the Harlem uh, Renaissance to some degree, but there, there also the cotton plant, the cotton harvest was experiencing some problems through the boll weevil that basically uh, creates a root rot, uh, if I'm not mistaken, to the cotton itself. And so uh, many of these aspects kind of began driving them from lack of political rights to lack of opportunity, lack of mistreatment because of Jim Crow laws. They went to the north, and it was there that you know there were opportunities in the north. And the wages were higher and the workdays were shorter, but many of them found that they also experienced discrimination and they were paid less than white people counterparts um, uh, who, who were doing of the same and equal work. Here is an example. I won't spend a lot of time on it, but not every African American who came north experienced challenges. There were those who did because of the Freedmen's Bureau. Please go back and look that up and the importance this had. and and construction of state-funded colleges because of the Merrill Act. Um, many um, poor or disenfranchised whites as well as African Americans were able to go to college and move into the cities and develop uh, either a business as a banker or a lawyer or some sort of profession that worked within uh, those um, minority groups there. And so this is a situation where you see an African American family certainly using their college degree to establish a middle-class income. Uh, as what continues, as more and more African-Americans move into various cities, they move into neighborhoods, just much like the immigrants do, whether you're Italian or German or Polish, you were gravitating to the neighborhoods that spoke your same language, had your same cultural values, had your same jokes, whatever. Um, this is what took place, uh, for instance, in the Harlem area of New York City. And, and we'll find in the next time period uh, when we talk about jazz and, and, and music, etc., um, this is where a new form of music comes and catapults itself that captivates the attention of the American people. And, and so a Southern culture is emerging and being created there right in, in these major cities. Okay. One thing you need to recognize is the role that the church has for many uh, in the African American community is, is the fact that it not only is unifying them uh, in their spiritual journey and in their own spiritual nourishment, but it also became a place where they talked politics. And it is still to this day that often many presidents or politicians will go visit African American churches and they will have a chance to talk and share and present themselves to the congregation. This still takes place today and is still important part fabric of their culture um, in, in the cities. Now let's talk about how the cities expand upward and outward. 
and sometimes for the better and sometimes for the worse. So as you recognize, and just as an example, Manhattan is an island. And as an island, there's only so much of it that you can use and occupy. And with trying to create the Great Central Park out of there, they've carved out so much available space for people to have access to. Uh, any of these uh, homes that were there or two-story places we quickly became recognized by architects, etc., that it's more valuable to tear down the two-story homes and begin building these 10-story homes. And what began being built were these things called Dumball um, tenement houses. And if I was a little bit more prepared, I would have found a picture of it. But essentially, from the top down, it actually looks like a dumbbell that you would hold and they're attached side by side, so a pair of dumbbells. And in the middle are shafts of air that has windows that go out. Now, they were ugly, they were, they, uh, they, uh, were not very convenient, um, and what made them even more challenging is that on every floor, um, they had to have so many windows per room uh, and kitchen, which was cool, and shafts and access to air. But what was sad is that they all shared, each floor shared a common bathroom. And so if you had family after family stuffing into these rooms and into these buildings, you can imagine there is one said story that in one building, 800 people were sharing one restroom. You, you can't even imagine that. I mean, I've gone to some football games in the NFL, etc. that, you know, outhouses out there in the parking lot. You're like, hmm, can you imagine, you know, that? Don't even want to, want to think about. So as cities went vertical, they also had to come up with new ways to go horizontal. And this is where new transportation methods, new technological methods came into place. And so with the the electric trolley cars and the subways and the bridges, namely the Brooklyn Bridge, the first uh, uh, br bridge that was a free suspension bridge and the longest at the time um, was created in order to give access for people who want to live outside the city. And so on the Brooklyn Bridge, which made it unique, is it had, I think, three levels to it. It had for pedestrian traffic, it had for vehicle traffic, and it also had for cable car or electric trolley cars to pass through this. So quite an engineering feat and marvel at its time. So number four, there is a guy named Jacob Reese in the 1890s who went around and on his own kind of was an investigative reporter. And we'll talk a little bit about him when we get into 1901 and 1905 with Teddy Roosevelt. But this guy made it his job to go around and take pictures to find out what it was like for people working in the factories or in their homes that they lived in their tenement houses, etc. And this is where that dumbbell, you know, I want to look that up, dumbbell um, design of a tenement housing. But you can recognize is that um, because of his pictures, Jacob Reese presented to different city officials, they began recognizing that building codes needed to be uh, created and followed through and new government jobs had to be developed to make sure uh, con contractors were held accountable for this type of thing. And what we began to recognize is that codes were important because, for instance, the Great Fire of Chicago, um, over 90 some percent of the city was wiped out. Why? Because they built adjacent adjacent properties that were made out of wood. Well, after that, um, there came um, laws that everything had to have steel girding on the inside and stone facades are made of stone. These were new things that had to make sure that uh, the, the, because of the force density, fires wouldn't come in and kill and destroy. Here's a picture of Jacob Reese um, of men working, kind of giving a great idea of how they often had to work and live in the same place uh, in order to eke out a living. Um, but can you imagine being a young person there trying to uh, do those types of things? So Jacob Reese, please know his name and the significance of what he brought and how he focused on how the other half, really the other 90% lived, if you will. Okay, so uh, you can see there that tenements or these places where they worked and lived and, and created anywhere they could pockets of industry in order to survive on that. But as a result of these things, you have more and more people moving into these poorer areas, creating sanitation problems, disease issues, fire congestion, crime. It was not the place to be by any measure of the means. And so one's immigrant's goal was, is the moment you moved in and you saw what deplorable conditions you were, is you made whatever sacrifices you could to save, 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 and to, to try and get out of various tenements and slums and into other areas where rent was a little bit more 
but it was better for your family or for your kids. Uh, another thing that you know you need to recognize that the city had to address the government was not willing to do this until you know again New York City being the second largest city in the world they had to address it somehow and so you know recognizing that they need to create new sewage systems they need to create new ways to get water to the people they had to recognize that crime and violence was running rampant there um, prostitution was running rampant there and so because of Jacob Reese bringing these things to light the government had to respond and come up with some plans. Well, they're firmly affixed in the midst of this. Number five is this thing called a political machine and city bosses. Well, because the city governments were fragmented, there emerged an opportunity for different minority groups, namely maybe the Polish or the Italian um, or, or Catholics, if you wanted to do even on religious per things, where they, they developed um, strict party machines where they offered services and help to people who were new. So for instance, um, maybe an immigrant had just moved in from Italy and Aunt Bethel uh, Beatrice, I guess, um, knew of her, her you know, sister would be needing housing. So she would go to the political machine office, knock on their door and say, hey, my aunt's coming into town. Do you know of any housing? And they'll say, well, we certainly do. But be sure to remember us when it's time to vote and be sure to remember us when we need to pass a certain law, etc., etc. And so this is what they did, it, you know, a quid quo pro, like a tick for attack. You, you rub my back, I rub your back. And so if the government was efficient, um, you know, as I'm trying to argue, there would have been no need for city and political bosses. But since they weren't efficient because the government was not offering any charities, uh, it was like a gap that just people filled in. As, as best as they could. What did this create? Well, it, it forced churches to try and make decisions. Do we want to be helpful and, and bring about reforms? Or are we just going to kind of do our own thing? And it also created ways in which, you know, bribery can be set up to say, hey, look the other way as we're constructing this 10-story high-rise. Is it the whole point just to get them housing? We don't need to worry about if the plumbing works just yet. Let's just get them in the building. And so this, this created a lot of problems that you hear about you know, in other countries right now and in developing countries. But in America, trust me, we had the same type of things going on just as much. There's one person there that you need to be remembering of. It's Boss Tweed and Tammany Hall. He was rather famous for this. And so there was a guy that we'll talk about here soon named Thomas Nast who went around and started doing political tar cartoons and calling out, seriously, Tammany Hall and these city bosses and these political machines are saying, Really? Are you doing really good for the people? Because how is it that you're taking public monies and buying mansions? I think um, Boss Tweed had four mansions alone by monies from from the state and, and city monies. Um, state, yeah, in order to kind of line his own pockets. And, and his mind is like, I'm bringing a service to the people. I'm the ones finding them houses and give them doctors and everything else. Why shouldn't I be paid a fee for this type of stuff? But here's a great picture of Boss Tweed. And here, here's what you can see. He wasn't normally, he was a big guy, but uh, here's Boss Tweed making a decision and the cop policeman is, is looking up and wondering, hmm, boss, boss, how much help should I be given uh, to this guy? Should I put him into prison? Should I keep him out of prison? And that's how much sway Boss Tweed had on so many things that were taking place. Well, in the midst of this cage that is no longer gold, it has completely been scraped away and ugly. And you can see that on one hand, America's high has its sky rises, its lights, its shiny parks. Um, on the other hand, you see the underbelly, the scourge of society barely squeaking by in the pores and the tenements and the slums, okay? You see a group of people beginning to recognize that change is needed. And because of Thomas Nast and, and some other Christian service-minded people, there was a call to reform how things were done in government. And so in 1883, Congress passes this thing called the Pendleton Service uh, Reform Act, which is still basically in effect, basically saying friends can't bring in friends into politics. They have to meet a service, uh, they have to meet a certain amount of levels of proficiencies in certain areas. And what has this done? It has created in Washington, D.C., people who have worked for the government regardless of who the president is, as a career. So maybe they work in, in the financial uh, market. I'm forgetting the name of it right now. It's the auditing, the government auditing 
thing. Maybe they got uh, 400,000 people working for the government's auditing department. Those aren't people that come and go based on loyalty to a par party or a president. How did this change happen? It change happened because of the Pendleton Civil Service Reform Act that created a way in which not just the cronies get in or the favorites, but those who are actually trained and capable of that. Some other urban reformers you should be aware of during this time period is Jane Adams, and it's with two D's. Please know that two D's. You can get, you know, misspellings aren't marked wrong for you on this in this class, but if you want to geek out, she has two D's. What made her unique is Jane Adams came from a wealthy, wealthy Chicago family. She um, went off to college, one of the rare women who, uh, uh, not that women are rare or women aren't capable, but during that time, to go off to college and to finish college. Um, she could have had the easy life finishing college, could have married into another well-to-do family, could have done the life that seemed whatever most wanted to do. Not her. She had a calling and a passion as she looked around, looked at pictures by Jacob Reese, followed how the government was unraveling, how there were thousands upon thousands upon thousands of immigrant children who were not being taken care of, hearing stories about how women are being abandoned by husbands who are abusive and alcoholics in the immigrant realm. She says, we got to do something about it. And so she used her wealth and her connections to convince, remember, wealthy people were leaving their downtown large homes or estates for the suburban. And so there were homes there that could be gobbled up and, and found out. So let me just forward you to one. So here's one such home. It's called the whole house. And so she actually got three of these put together. Um, huge established places that at one time used to have regal parties. Now what is she using them for? To house women who um, are, have been abandoned uh, and, and giving them lessons in English, giving them daycare for their children so the, wife, so the women go out to work, uh, giving them um, skills to be kind of uh, independent and a really, really cool thing uh, there. And so this, this idea called the settlement houses um, became a blueprint for other large cities in, uh, in New York City to duplicate it. Even San Francisco was considering at the time. And so all that was re you know, inspired through religious aspects of, called the social gospel, where we want to have the Christian message to go out and be heard, but the best way for it to be heard is to act out how Christ would want it to be acted out, not preach from a sermon. These resources were given to the urban poor. And, and so quite a uh, cool response uh, from a non-government agency, mind you, but from the church itself to meet the needs of the people. So as I shared with you with the story of Teddy in the cage, um, you know, the government wasn't there to help and provide, but a Christian agency that we were there doing service with at a, at a orphanage was. And so I, I just hope that you can make the connection uh, between the two. So let us go on then to the next subject, and that is uh, module 6.8, and how culture and society were changed under the Gilded Age. And this is gonna be hopefully light and more uh, happy. Uh, if you think. And so here is, a, in Chicago, there was this great uh, Colombian uh, exposition that um, was supposed to help America be seen on the center stage. Think of it as, as like one huge trade show. And it is there that America gets to show off all the neat things that we have been inventing or creating or doing. And so Chicago um, basically rebuilt an entire downtown section and all of white buildings and had street lights. And so when the rest of the world came over to see what this exposition was like, when the rest of the businessmen, etc., they were like in awe of what had taken place. And so here is one of the promotions saying, sell the cook stove if necessary and come. You must see this fair saying, you will not be disappointed and be amazed uh, with this type of thing. I'm gonna reveal to you, you know, it's a little brief story here, but um, I, I can remember, um, Back in the day, if you go to in Disneyland, where the Autopia is, that building that used to, that circles around, I don't know what it is now, but back in my day, it was called Tomorrow, Tomorrowland. And in that, it used to be a moving theater that, that it twirled, but in the center were these stage mock-ups of what a modern kitchen would look like, a modern house would look like, all these things. I'm like, dude, that's, that's way cool. Why can't we have those types of things? You know, I mean, in my mind, it seemed like space age, the Jetsons type of stuff. So it was just an exposition to promote kind of some of America's ingenuity 
you know, and I think General Electric sponsored it, if I'm not mistaken. So it was a brilliant strategy by, uh, you know, American branding and marketing, if you will, as Disneyland had opened to show off the American trade system. So much the same thing uh, there. Uh, I do have to share just a little sad thing, since this topic is dealing with lifestyles of consumerisms. I, I am no guilty. Um, I love adventure and I love doing things. And so um, this, this chapter that we're going to be talking about is the pursuit of consumers to convince American people that spending is good because the more we spend, the more that factories produce. So the more that factories produce, the more workers we have to hire. And hopefully we pay them a decent wage. And the more workers we hire creates a bigger middle class. And then the bigger the middle class, the better life is it for everybody. That's kind of how the economics of this capitalistic system kind of works. Well, me, I was thinking about in preparation for this lesson, um, I have in my garage, literally right now, uh, four surfboards, uh, three boogie boards, two wetsuits. I have a mountain bike and a road bike. I have three motorcycles. Yes, three motorcycles. One, my big BMW and my two other bikes that I take my boys out on. What else is in my garage that I can think of? Um, oh, I have a huge thing where I store my wines and beers and other things in there. Um, I can't even begin thinking what's oh, all the camping gear for every possible season of camping. You name it. I am a consumer. Now, this is just a teacher, okay, that, that I just, I enjoy a lifestyle of being in the outdoors. And so I have all the things that let me do those types of things. Is it overkill? My wife would say, yes, it's overkill. Start unloading it. When's the last time you surfed? Well, I'm like, yeah, I haven't surfed since, you know, Labor Day. Uh, but I've been riding my bike three times a week. I've been out of my motorcycle once, you know. So it all depends on the ebb and flow of things. But I am a consumer. I'm sure maybe your families are not any different. And, and so we'll find out where did this consumerism come and why do we have to be such consumers? Well, it starts back here in the Gilded Age. And so we need to recognize that in with coming to the city, people now had maybe more consistent money, although hard to get and the hours were sucky and long. They now had Saturday afternoons and all of Sunday to figure out what am I going to do with this extra money? Maybe I'll go to the movie house. Maybe I'll go to the park. Maybe I'll go out to eat. Maybe I'll go hit the bars, whatever. Um, so this culture of consumption began emerging. And who was none too happy to allow this consumption? Corporate capitalists. They want this opportunity to have their businesses expand. They want the opportunity to keep the factories running and humming and us buying, etc. And so this created, of course, yes, there was a widening middle class that was emerging that I'll talk about here next. But you need to recognize that this capitalism created a lot of money in the hands of very, very few. Uh, the Vanderbilts, for instance, built one of the most opulent palaces, if you will, out there in North Carolina and, and Ash, Asheville um, that would, would rival anything that you find there uh, in, in Europe at the time. And so these homes and apartments and, and second homes were, were just as a way for the wealthy to kind of display their wealth, but also it allowed them to buy and import goods from out of Europe and create different jobs for different people. But you need to recognize that the middle class did begin to emerge. Where did the middle class come from? Well, people who worked in the inside managerial, clerical, uh, accounting. Because remember of, of this new scientific management system that required paperwork and paper trails and consistent dialogue between telegrams to from West Coast to East Coast and telegrams to Europe. All that stuff had to be followed and clerics had to be done. And with colleges emerging and creating new opportunities for doctors and lawyers and dentists, etc., you begin seeing a middle class emerging. And with that, you begin seeing America that is able to begin spending money and enjoying life a little bit better. And also with that, we see a changing in gender roles, not only in consumption, but now we have a shift where, okay, um, during the industrial revolution, we have um, you know men and women engaging uh, in the workplace or creating more defined roles within the home. But I want to start talking about is how the women began to recognize that they could be part of the consumer culture. And they began um, visiting department stores like Macy's. That is a huge urban center, four stories tall and a big building where you can find anything and everything you want with had 
clothing that they can buy off the shelves that they didn't have to sew themselves or hire seamstress to do and prepackaged goods. It was just the thing to do. Here's a great magazine that was done called The Delineator, drawing a line in the sand that here reflects the attitudes that women can begin enjoying game and sports and things that at one time were not relegated to them, but they certainly could um, because they've either become uh, liberated um, from college or they're not responsible by being married to someone else. There's a lot of factors to this, but we can recognize that women certainly did have greater opportunity for leisurely activities that were available to them prior to that. You also begin to recognize that the men begin creating these little secret societies and fraternal orders. Uh, I'm not saying YMCA is a fraternal order. That's a Christian organization that emerged and there was a women's YMCA type of thing as well where they were trying to keep their bodies fit and strong both spiritually and, and physically. But you begin to recognize that since there's leisure time available, new sports begin to emerge. Yes, baseball, yes, basketball, but there's new sport like football. We see ba a, a big draw towards um, this um, pugilistic type of mindset with um, um, boxing takes place. And there's one thing that even we begin seeing that gender roles, that there's some allowances of a gay community emerging in parts of New York and parts of Boston. Um, and there is a book was written called The Bostonians of 1886, where it, it talks in details about uh, women living in monogamous uh, situations that um, kind of was received well in the big cities. And these neighborhoods were kind of just um, seen as just a, a place for them to go and to be part of a journey where they recognize the liberties with one another. Here's just another example of a changing mindset of women out there on these these bikes. Don't these bikes look immense compared to the size of the women? I don't know what's going on there, but uh, anyhow. Now, how do the working class enjoy their leisure? Well, the leisure varied based on their race or their gender or their region. And often the men enjoyed, you know, spectator sports like boxing or watching a football thing. You got to realize when Harvard and Yale played during this time period, I think there were over 50,000 people there in the stands to watch uh, this early game version of football. Uh, during that time. Wives had different places they liked to gather, but nonetheless, they had their own sense of leisure activities. Whether they enjoy going to the Nickelodeons, where they can go see short movies for five cents, or they can go to the dance clubs, you begin seeing new music emerging there in, in the um, called Tin Pan Alley uh, areas of Chicago, Harlem, um, are the two epicenters of where you see music changing uh, there where music was brought up from the south and re-emerging there in the big cities. You see vaudeville acts emerging that were affordable for people to go see, which was a great form of entertainment. And so what we need to recognize is that consumerism became a part of American culture during the Gilded Age, and our industrial leaders really wanted that because that's what helped keep them working.